Okay, now okay. it's seven, we can start. Yes. Okay, uh, we can start then. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today or someday in the future if you're watching the recording on our YouTube channel. Before giving the floor to our dearest guest, I want to introduce our team. My name is Madonna Ajopadze. I'll be the moderator of today's conference. I'm the last new neurosurgery resident in Georgia, Sakatvelo. I'm also a PhD candidate and assistant professor at the New Vision University in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia. Today, I will have very smart and beautiful assistant co-moderator, Mariam Natslishvili. Uh, she is the fifth year medical student at the New Vision University. Uh, so Mariam, cheer her up. This is the first time being a co-moderator. And Mariam, can you introduce our team further? Hello, can you hear my voice now better or not? Uh, there is some echo, but go on. Uh, I, I was trying to do it with another device, but I don't know if it's working or not. It's okay. Okay, so I uh, I would start first of all with thanks because it's really a big pleasure for me. Thanks as the co-moderator of that great conference. Thanks for uh, Dr. Hassan and Dr. Madonna to give me that opportunity. Uh, let's go further to our conference about it. What we can tell you is that this online education meeting have started with Professor Hassan Khamis Suju, uh, who is Residency Program Director of the Neurosurgery Department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents. Also, with the contributions of the neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department. Also, neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from European countries like Bulgaria and Georgia. All the microphones, what we have here, will be uh, turned off during the presentation of the lecturer to avoid voice and noise pollution and other things. You can ask your questions, uh, all of you, uh, by writing on the chat part of the Zoom program. and. At the end of the meeting, if you will have other question or you want to ask uh, the question by voice, not only writing, you can ask, of course, and uh, your question will be discussed. And mutual discussions, for example, if one is speaking and another is joining with that speech, is not allowed because it is not appropriate for the format of that meeting. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned on. Uh, we will turn uh, it on at the end of the meeting. So um, about me, as Dr. Madonna mentioned, I'm a fifth year medical student at New Vision University, Georgia, Sakat Fellow. I am interested in neuro from the school time, uh, from eighth class. I'm interested in neuro and all I think. There are some oh, I think there is a connection problem, so I'm going to continue, jump in. Um, before I introduce our dearest guest today, I want to express my sincere and the most heartfelt condolences to the people of Turkey due to the uh, tragic events of earthquake. Uh, uh, and now it's my distinct privilege and honor to, pre uh, to present our lecturer today, Professor Carmen Fleckhardt um, um, Glenkamp. Uh, she is one of the few women in leadership positions in spine surgery. Uh, she has broken the glass ceiling in this male dominating surgical subspecialty. She has received her master's degree in pharmacy and uh, later graduated from the medical school at the University of Utrecht. In 2006, she completed her residency in neurosurgery at the Leiden University Medical Center and went on to obtain her PhD in peripheral nerve regeneration. However, she, her passion for the spine surgery uh, took the upper hand and she began her subspecialization in 2006. And now she has a special interest in craniocervical deformities and reconstruction as well uh, as a, a, a contraplegia. In 2007, she became a senior member of the Stop of Her Alma Matter, where she currently has the Spine Research Group. She's a physician, she's a scientist, she serves as a 
is the creator of the Cervical Spine Research Society, and she currently mentors numerous PhD uh, students on the themes varying from cervical to lumbar, from degenerative to the congenital spine disease. She and her research groups have received several research prizes. She has a long list of scientific publications and invited guest lectures. And she's actively involved in spinal teaching, supervises special, uh, several PhD trajectories, and is involved in the spine training programs. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Lancome's most impressive asset is her humanity, and she's a proud mother of three, and she's constantly recognized for her bedside manner by the patients as well as the staff, and her experiences as a physician and her richness of doctor-patient contact always inspires future generations uh, of physicians. Uh, thank you again, Professor, um, and welcome again. The virtual stage is yours, so now you can start screen sharing. Thank you, and sorry for this long introduction. No, thank you for such a very nice introduction in which you are um, too kind for me. Um, currently, I am um, trying to share my screen. Yes, I manage. Well, um, well, thank you all for your attention. And uh, what I would like to discuss with you for the um, for the coming uh, uh, hour is uh, the cervical spine, and in particularly the uh, problems that we encounter uh, when we want to treat uh, cervical spine radiculopathy. And um, this is um, the 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 very nice announcement that was made for me. And um, here it shows um, what I actually want to uh, uh, talk to you about, and that's namely the long-term outcome results um, after comparing arthrodesis to um, fusion. Yes. Um, no. Um, well, I do not know whether one of you in the audience once um, uh, implanted a cervical disc prosthesis, but uh, in our uh, part of Europe in, well, let's say 10, 12, 13 years ago, it became very popular to implant a cervical disc prosthesis. And um, I would like to explain to you why this, um, well, this idea that a disc prosthesis instead of a cage um, was such a beneficial option. Um, if in, in, in the articles and in the literature that was uh, written about the advantages of a, a prosthesis, uh, time over and over again, the article of Hillebrand is, um, is, 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 is referred to. And what does this say? This say, and I do completely agree with that, with the idea that is that if you have a, a fused segment, particularly in your cervical spine, then you have a higher chance on um, um, in, increased uh, uh, degeneration at the adjacent levels. This occurs all over the spine, or this is possible to occur all over the spine. However, in the thoracic area, as you know, we have the um, thoracic cage and that deprives it of the, the that prevents the uh, adjacent le level disease because the mobility of the adjacent level is much less. And when we are um, uh, taking into account the lumbar spine, then the forces are um, much more um, uh, uh, equalized over the much larger bone. However, focusing on the cervical spine, it seems realistic that if you have a fusion at one of the levels, that this increases the force on the adjacent levels. And well, it is a reasonable idea that the, this increased degeneration may cause problems in the future. However, this article of Hillebrand claimed that there was an incidence of adjacent disc degeneration of 2.9% per year. Well, imagine that uh, that means that if you have a herniated disc operation, if your disc is replaced by a cage or by autologous bone and you have a fusion at that level, that 10 years thereafter, you have a 30% chance of having adjacent level disease. Well, um, I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that um, all of you who um, 
repeatedly operate on the cervical spine for an anterior discectomy, that's not a number that you really um, are familiar with. And what we were thinking in our group is that it was mainly aiming at degeneration that was radiological visible, however, also in time after surgery. As you see here in the lower part, in this Hillebrand article, no baseline degeneration was described. So we think that it might be true that this, the part of this degeneration was already present at the beginning. However, um, as I, I said before, the whole idea of accelerated degeneration at the adjacent level was appealing. So we can understand that a prosthesis might be beneficial. However, if you want to prove something, if, if you want to know whether this is really true, you have to um, uh, perform some research for that yourself. So therefore, we designed in uh, Leiden, then the Hague area, the neck trial. And the goal of this trial was to evaluate the effectivity of different surgical treatments for a cervical herniated disc. So in fact, what we wanted to compare is the way we usually treated a cervical radiculopathy due to a herniated disc, namely with a cage. In the years before, we also we, we um, um, tended to implant autologous bone with a plate. However, those people were well, most of the time, the surgical intervention in the cervical spine went absolutely fine and the pain in their arm was relieved, which is when you look into literature normal because the success percentage of such a type of um, surgery is 90 to 95% considering the arm pain. However, what we encountered is that those patients complained mainly about the pain at their crista. So then we left the autologous bone implants and we started with implanting cages, which was satisfactory in our clinic. But in order to evaluate whether, whether the prosthesis for some patients maybe could even be more beneficial, we designed this trial and comparing ACDF to ACDA. So ACDA stands for arthroplasty. What we also did in our area is that we implant that we um, did not implant anything at all. If the level was somewhat too degenerative and the disc space was, well, not too large, we also tended to put in nothing. And if we were in um, on international podia, people used to make fun of us because they said that's really impossible, although we thought that it was possible and that patients were doing good. So we decided when um, designing this trial, not only to evaluate the difference between the ACDF and the ACDA, but also to take the ACD into consideration. Well, it was a multi-center trial, several centers from all over the Netherlands. They, um, well, they wanted to cooperate with us. So we had a double, and so we had a randomized trial, of multi, multiple centers, and we double, we decided to double blind it. So not only was it that the research nurse who evaluated the, uh, the, the patients after surgery, but also the patients themselves remained blinded until two years after surgery. What we did to do is a systematic review um, for degenerative disc disease. That's how we started uh, in, in designing the trial in the, in the process of, um, of, of, of seeing whether um, well, something was already known about this. And in this systematic review, we evaluated that there was very low quality evidence that there was little or no difference in pain relief between the two techniques. Thus, uh, we thought, well, it is... Um, it's, 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 it's a very good idea to perform a trial as I just um, designed, as I just explained to you. Um, the thing is, later on, we re-evaluated the literature on cervical um, uh, anterior disectomy. And by that time, numerous articles um, had seen the light comparing ACDF to ACDA. So we thought, well, maybe first we should take a look at what literature can tell us about the comparison between ACDA and ACDF. And what we found is that most of the articles, they describe a mixed population of patients, a population of patients that does not only have a cervical radiculopathy only in the arm due to a herniated disc, but also a population that is suffering from a myelopathy due to a herniated disc. And well, since you're all doctors or um, you, you know that there is a big difference in pathology between a cervical radiculopathy and a cervical myelopathy. There are two things that are very important. 
um, in, in, in comparing these um, or, or putting all these patients in, in one group. The first thing is the outcome parameters. If you have a cervical myelopathy, the pain in your arm is not, well, actually not present. So you have a different type of, you need a different type of outcome parameter evaluating a myelopathy or a radiculopathy. So that one thing why these two cannot be very well compared. And the other thing is that if you have a myelopathy, you have a, well, the vast majority of those patients have a degenerated spine already. And if you have a degenerated spine that already has some, well, um, osteophytes all over the cervical um, spine, then it is the question whether it is so beneficial to keep it moving. Maybe it can even be worse because your body is an intelligent instrument. And when your body decides that it has to uh, stop moving, it might be a bad idea to take all the, um, the, the natural fusion away and make it moving again. That might even deteriorate the things. Well, and when you compare um, a, a, a myelopathy and radiculopathy patients, it may be that your um, that your the, the, the spread in your outcome is so large that you do not find a difference between ACDA and ACDF. So we thought that it would be much better to take uh, to 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 go deep into literature and to um, look only at those articles that evaluate cervical radiculopathy. And when we did so, we found that starting with a lot of articles, we've seen that only eight of the articles present at that time, 2019, described the pure radiculopathy. And um, this is what we actually evaluated. What you can see here when we look at these are the eight studies. Here you see the mean and the eye, and here you see the vast neck pain. Oh, um, here. Sorry, I was. Yes, the NDI and the fast neck pain, which are the most important parameters when we're talking about cervical radiculopathy. And um, we see here their baseline values and here the values two years thereafter. Well, when you look at the NDI, here you can see that the differences in NDI at baseline are <laughs> different between the groups, but that they are comparable between the two. So at baseline, that's good. However, two years follow-up demonstrates that the differences are not that big between the two groups, as you can see here. Same holds true for the, vas and for the, for the neck pain. You see that the neck pain in both groups, well, went way below the, uh, the, the, the magic border of four. So you see that either performing an ACDA or an ACDF has a very well effect on the neck pain and on your mean neck disability index. No difference between ACDF and ACDA. Because literature is so very positive about the prosthesis, we decided to also take make an overview of the cervical radiculopathy in the mixed population. So how it was conventionally. Um, um, uh, 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 brought to us. And then we could include 29 articles. But when we look at these 29 articles, we see actually, well, more or less the same. So even in this group of patients that you actually should not compare for the reasons that I just explained, here in yellow, I indicated the only articles in which some difference was present. And this was whether the article when the article gave uh, a significant difference between the two values. And this does not even take into account the clinical mi the minimal clinical important difference. When we are here, for instance, observing the mean and the I, and here, when it is after two years, thirteen versus seventeen, well, the minimal clinical important difference is not reached. Here this well, here you might think it, and well, as, as you can see, the results are um, either they are comparable or it is a little bit better in the ACDA group or sometimes a little bit worse, but the differences are very, very small. So this is a realistic view upon the uh, literature which has been um, uh, published up till, well, let's say 2020. So what can we conclude? There are only 
significant differences, but it's only in a minority of articles. And um, there was a satisfactory decrease at follow-up in both groups, both ACA and ACDF. Minical clinical important difference was not reached. And also important, the author was usually a consultant for the company that introduced this prosthesis. So all in all, it's not very convincing that an ACDA is better than an ACDF, just based on data from literature. But we also evaluated whether radiological differences would exist between the two groups. And this is an overview of only those articles that were published reporting on radiological differences between a group with a prosthesis, groups with an ACDF. And again, we first um, 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 uh, observe our values that were evaluated in the radiculopathy patients, yeah, as, as, as you saw before, only um, a few of them uh, reporting only on uh, cervical radiculopathy. And from the eight that were discussed before, there are only seven that uh, report on a radiculopathy. And here you can see how meager those results are. When we are looking at the adjacent level disease, in the prosthesis, it was five versus three, two versus not evaluated, six versus 12. So actually this article from Janssen is the only one that says in ACDF, adjacent level disease is 13%. So that's convincingly more than the 6% two years after an uh, implantation of a prosthesis. Furthermore, again, we also evaluate the adjacent segment disease in the mixed group. So the group of patients that has degeneration by nature and the group of patients with a radiculopathy. When you look at these significances in adjacent level disease, here you see somewhat more often that there is a um, significant difference. Here is no significant difference, here no. So some no's and uh, also articles that did not evaluate it. It is important, as I said before, that when you report on adjacent level disease, that you also evaluate the preoperative data at the adjacent level. And here, I think this is rather striking that in the last column, that only a few of those article, articles observed the uh, baseline adjacent level disease. Actually, it's from all these articles, it's only four, five, six articles. And this one did not look at significance. So five out of all these articles did look at baseline, and then they found if a difference in radiological adjacent level disease. So not even said that that would lead to clinical um, problems. And um, uh, evaluating the study about the clinical results that I just presented to you, it's not very logical or not to be expected that it will give clinical problems. However, radiologically, it may be present in a minority of studies. So when we take this all together, we can conclude that radiological signs of adjacent segment disease were present at baseline in almost half of the patients, and that there's a low level of evidence that this increases more in the fusion group at a long-term follow-up. was only, how, however, only studied in a mixed study population, which is degenerative by diagnosis. Um, there are also some other aspects radiologically that were evaluated in these studies. Here, we evaluate in the radiculopathy studies again, Another, uh, a, a few other aspects that are relevant in um, the course of the disease. When you can um, evaluate the range of motion, well, of course, the range of motion was present in the patients who had a prosthesis and not in the patients who were fused. So, but you see, not in all studies, it was evaluated. When we are looking at cage migration or prosthesis migration, well, that was hardly ever studied. Same holds true for subsidence, hardly ever studied. And here it was only PARC reported 15% and no and none in the ACDP group. Implant loosening, almost not studied. Fusion rate, almost not studied. Pseudoarthrosis, heterotopic ossification, bridging bone. You see, it is in all those studies, there is a lot of information present, but they do not evaluate it or hardly evaluate it. 
This is even worse when we again look in the mixed population. Well, the, 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 the numerous times that you see NA not studied is, uh, well, it's, it's not too, uh, it doesn't make you happy. Um, when we studied specifically heterotopic ossification, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, heterotopic ossification is the overgrowth of bone of a mobile segment. So that is something that you study in patients who have been implanted with a prosthesis because a prosthesis is meant to remain mobile over time. However, if you have overgrowth of bone, then you call this heterotopic ossification. In this um, uh, overview of articles, it was reported to be present in almost 10% of patients, and it seemed predominantly present in radiculopathy patients with a very low level of incidence. We'll come back to, the, to this heterotopic ossification later on with, uh, when considering our own results. So what can we conclude from literature? Although the cervical disc prosthesis was introduced to decrease adjacent level disease, convincing radiological evidence is lacking, Heterotopic ossification is insufficiently studied, and the current literature and the outcome of cervical disc prosthesis not convinces and does not justify the higher costs of implanting a prosthesis. However, we also have our own study, and we can also look at our own results because, well, I was somewhat critical about the results that were already published in literature. Well, let's see whether we can do it better. Comparing the three groups, as I introduced uh, to you before, the arthrodesis, the prosthesis, the ACDF with a cage, and the ACD. These were our inclusion criteria. Um, patients had to have complaints for over eight weeks. And, and at MRI, we had to see a herniated disc uh, herniation at the symptomatic level. The outcome, our primary outcome parameter was the NDI, and secondary outcome parameters were both radiological and uh, clinical. And we had a follow-up two years and later up to 55 years, which we, which we will also demonstrate here. Well, um, we, um, uh, we were able to, um, to include 109 patients that were evenly distributed, distributed over the three groups. And um, these are the parameters um, of the patient groups, and you see that they are all comparable. They are not too old, and they are not too fat. They have a baseline NDI that is really well disabling, uh, between 50 and 55, and also a baseline pain in the neck of 56 to 50. Um, of course, they all had radiculop uh, radiculopathy complaints. There was only one patient that also had very mild medullar complaints, but radiculopathy complaints were um, dominant. Well, this is always nice when you have a uh, presentation. You do not have to wait for two years for the, for the outcome. I can show it to you right away. Well, and actually this says, this says it all. This is the NDI and it scores over the two years. And you see that the three groups, I do not even have to point out which line corresponds to what treatment. They are all, they're all equal and comparable. Same holds true for the neck pain and for the arm pain, comparable in the three groups. However, when we look at the perceived recovery, so what we did after one year and after two years, we asked the patients, um, are you satisfied with the intervention that you received? Then we see when we're looking at the last column, two years after surgery, is that two years after surgery, the, um, only, well, two thirds of the patient says, yes, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm really very happy. Or they say, yeah, I'm happy. It, it was okay. And I really improved. The other one third said, Complaints remain the same, or they said mm, it's even worse. Same holds true for the arm pain, same percentage. So then you wonder what happens there. What is the difference between the three groups? Well, you can see surgery time in the prosthesis group was somewhat longer, but the other things are almost comparable. Then we see how is this result five years thereafter? Five years thereafter, we still had a um, very good follow up. Over 80% of patients uh, could, could still be um, uh, approached, and they gave us their uh, results. 
And what we see here when we look at the neck disability index is that over the first two years, as we've seen before, it's all uh, comparable. But then what we see that the NDI in the group without a cage and without a prosthesis goes up and up in the NDI is worse. So mm, this is getting in the wrong direction five years after surgery. However, our main primary question was, is an ACDA better than an ACDF? No, that is even after five years comparable. Same holds true for arm pain and for neck pain. We see the same tendency that if you do not implant anything, that you have a tendency to have more neck pain and more arm pain, but that the ACDA and ACDF they um, well, they 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 do well. They have comparable outcome. You can discuss that we have insufficient power, because we calculated that we needed a sample size of 166 based on a medical clinical important difference between the groups of 20 percent. So that would mean 20 points. However, the maximal difference that we gained was 15. But if you look at the treatment effect. Then you see that they were the treatment effects between the groups was really, really very low. And we're talking now about two years after surgery. We're really very low. So I, we think that our data are convincing. However, we combined our data with a systematic review that was performed at the same time in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And they also compared the same three groups, ACDF, ACDA, and ACD. It was the same setup. So we combined our data and then we had a total of 250 patients. And then when we look at the mean differences, well, they are really, really very small between the groups. None is significant. So then we can say that two years after surgery that the differences between the three groups was, were, are to be neglected. Well, then it is interesting when you have more patients, is there any particular subgroup of patients that you can um, point out that benefits more or less for one intervention than the other. For instance, what we were thinking, maybe if that a patient which, has a, uh, which is younger benefits more from ACDA. Well, that appeared not to be true. We thought, well, maybe if the disc height is higher, well, we were almost sure, then maybe that's the group where the ACDA performs better. No, again, no difference. We also evaluated whether there was a difference, whether you had a high or a low BMI. We compared, does it matter whether you smoke or whether you don't? Does it make a difference whether you're male or female? There were, was no SIP group to be appointed that was doing better or doing worse. So no difference again between the three groups. And this is to demonstrate even, we hope more convincingly, that there is no tendency for an increasing disc height doing better with one treatment or the other. You see the blue circles are for the ACD, the green ones for the ACDF, and the, well, white, yellow, gray, don't know what color it is, is with arthroplasty. And you can see here, well, it's just a mix of, of circles, and it's not that you can um, see any pattern in it. So there's no, this, this is not an influence, uh, an, a factor of influence. Well, going back again to this satisfaction of the patients, then again, it's striking that when you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the satisfaction of patients in the ACD group, well, five years after surgery, it's only 50% that is uh, things that uh, the intervention that they had had a satisfactory result. Although in the fusion and arthroplasty group, the um, uh, satisfaction grew to 80%, so from 65 to 80%. When we're looking at the AQ5D, so health, then we see that in the ACDF and ACDA group, there are, there are very, very uh, happy with uh, what happened. And um, it was significantly less in the group with the ACD. So um, what we wanted to know, well, what is the factor that makes that some people do worse and that others do better. And then we thought, well, maybe it might be true that if patients are more um, anxious or depressed, that they do worse. So maybe that is a factor to, well, to take into account. And if we would know that that would be the case, then we could um, improve our patient counseling before surgery. So in order to evaluate this, we um, analyzed the um, 
uh, hospital anxiety and depression scale at baseline. And we also evaluated with a continuous study. Well, and this is what we found. Really interesting, we think. When you look at the baseline, there are patients that are scoring high on the depression and anxiety scale. You see those that we call the cases. And this is the NDI score. When they really score high in their depression, you see their NDI score is much higher at baseline when you compare it to these two. And then very interesting, throughout their treatment, you see that they remain in the higher segment. So that is important because we see that at baseline, it's not only a few patients, it's 24 of the patients. So one quarter indicates that they are depressed at baseline and one third indicates that, they're, well, that they have problems with their anxiety at baseline. Well, we think this is important to, um, to counsel uh, patients that you can give them such a scoring list before surgery and when they score that they are anxious and depressed, you can tell them, of course, we can do the sur surgical intervention and you will improve of it. Look, your peers also improve, but you will not improve as well as those that are not anxious or depressed. Um, well, maybe that is too far for now. Um, you can use um, these uh, scores to make prediction models. And then you get uh, results like this, and you can use this to actually make a prediction model. And then you get things like this for, for individual patients. And then you can tell them, look, this is what is the, for your, um, with, with your properties, this is what we would expect. But since you score high on your hospital and anxiety scale, we think that this is where you actually might end up. And this was, on, was then where the patient actually ended up. So you can give personalized medicine by this. Um, there are, well, to make it even more, um, um, uh, to, to dig more deeper into those data, there are also patients who have a baseline anxiety and depression, but when um, evaluating them, giving them this same questionnaire two years thereafter, that they improved in uh, anxiety and in depression. So we think that those patients also are anxious, depressed because of their radiculopathy. For instance, what you see here, these are... Um, Patient, when you when you look at um, um, at the green line, those are patients that have an increased hospital and anxiety scale at baseline, and then in mean uh, an NDI of fifty, so somewhat higher than those who are not anxious and depressed, and it decreases after two years, and when they report two years after surgery that uh, they are not anxious or depressed anymore then they end up in the same range as, um, the, as, as their peers who were not anxious and depressed at the beginning. So on the one hand, this is for those patients, very good news. That's what we like for them. However, it makes it more difficult for us to make predictions because it's not enough to just give them a scale, a baseline, and then predict how they will do in the end. So there must be somewhat, more, uh, somewhat other factors that we also want to evaluate. However, we made this very nice prediction modeling and what you, this very nice prediction model and what you can see here, you can, um, in this prediction model, you can set your depression scale that you score at baseline. You can set your anxiety scale and you can set your NDI at baseline. And then you get a personalized prediction of how you will, how you will do in those in in time and that, that's and, and also there's some spreading around it that's those are the gray lines but you can predict that this patient will do like this and you will also demonstrate that the um the majority of patients so that the 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 um uh, the average of patients is this line so we think that is a very very nice uh, r shiny model so in conclusions 
patients with anxiety and depression at baseline had a higher NDI during follow-up. And if the HOTS normalized, so the anxiety and depression normalized, then the NDI decreases to comparable levels as the ones that were not depressed at baseline. Um, we have a predictive model and we have an, our shiny application for preoperative counseling. Well, now I'd like to say some words in the re remaining time about the radiological um, um, uh, uh, outcome. What about the alignment of the cervical spine? Um, the majority of the patients has lordosis, although there are also patients that have a straight spine. So um, it may depend on the type of uh, implant you use, um, what happens with the shape of your cervical spine. Well, here is an overview of what happened to our 109 patients, of at least those who we could retrieve data from two years and five years thereafter. What we've seen from those patients who had a lower dose as a baseline, the vast majority had two years thereafter, still a lower doses. When we are looking at the patients with a straight spine, um, who went who who, uh, re, who went from lordosis to straight? It was uh, nine, and the patients who had a straight spine, in the majority of them, had a uh, remained this, the, the cervical spine remained straight. However, also some returned to lordosis. Interestingly, those patients with a kyphosis, um, only one remained in kyphosis, and five improved. They went to a straight spine, and even one even went to lordosis. And what happened when we are, are evaluating from two to five years in the radiological alignment of the cervical spine? Then we see that 64 patients could be evaluated. And then we see that uh, patients who went from lordosis to straight, that it was evenly distributed over the three groups. When we're looking from the patients who are doing better, straight to lordosis, in the ACDF group were three, in the ACD group four, and only one in ACDA. However, numbers are very, very small. And um, well, straight to lordosis, well, the ACD group, although we saw that their clinical results after five years were somewhat worse, um, well, one of those patients managed to get lordosis back. When we are looking at adjacent segment degeneration, what did we see? Well, evaluating adjacent segment degeneration should start at baseline, as I pointed out in the beginning. So what we see here at baseline is that in the group with ACDA, the adjacent segment degeneration at baseline was a little bit less, but it was not statistically significant, uh, significantly different. When we're looking at a one-year follow-up adjacent segment degeneration data, we see that the rate went up a little bit, but no difference between the groups. And two years thereafter, you see the degeneration goes up again a little bit. And you can see that it, it grows in all three groups. So we concluded that it is just a natural sign, something that well, happens in, well, the majority of patients at the adjacent segment. Whether you've implanted an AC, an, a prosthesis or whether you implanted a cage, doesn't matter. Some um, will uh, occur. But when we are um, looking at the reoperations, because we think that that is the clinical, um, that is clinically important adjacent level disease, because you can see something on your x-ray, but it doesn't mean that it really gives you problems. It can just be there because you also get older. So degeneration is just a natural process. However, if it, if it is um, invalidating so much that you want to be reoperated for it, well, that is an option. So what we've seen two years thereafter is that in the ACDA group, two patients were operated um, two years after the uh, original uh, surgical intervention. And in the ACDF group, it was only one patient and the ACD group, none, none of the patients. So what you can see is that only a minority of patients was reoperated at the adjacent levels. How was that five years thereafter? Well, not shocking, as you can see. Evenly distributed over the groups and in the ACDA group, none of the patients had to be reoperated. When we look at the literature and we look at the annual reoperation rates at the adjacent level, which we retrieved from the RCTs that we already studied before. Well, in our study, so we have a reoperation rate of this, and then you can see that it is comparable to the reoperation rate at the adjacent level um, 
and that um uh the uh that that also in literature there's not a difference between the ACDA and the ACDF only in this study of Dylan Martyr they find more reoperations in the ACDF group but again um this was a mixed study group and um the authors were um uh, consultants however I have to be careful with that because it's uh, I, I I have not studied that in detail, so I do not know for sure that they were um, well having some financial interest by uh, reporting better results in the ACDA group. But I I, I put in this um, this sheet so you can see that the reoperation rates are in this um, well in this 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 order. Um, there are also reoperations at the target level. And at the target level, the reoperations occur more often in the uh, after two years. And after five years, target level was only reoperated in an additional pa additional patients, uh, additional two patients from the ACD group. We think that operations, reoperations at the target level, well, that that is due to patients that keep on complaining about their original um, uh, arm pain or original neck pain. Because sometimes this target operation consisted of uh, putting on a plate. Sometimes it was a removal of the ACDA and then implanting a cage. And um, well, this, this can be, it, it's, it's hard in this group to distinguish whether there is still compression on the um, operated nerve or whether the patient is just not doing well and the surgeon, well, does not want to, um, to, to send away the patient without doing anything and just reoperates. Again, annual reoperation rates at the index levels retreat, uh, retreat from the RCTs. Then we see in our study that in the ACD group, that the number is really higher. And we've already thought we already saw that because here it is four after five years, and the others it's only one. So this is um, a higher number. So in conclusion, when we are talking about the disc prosthesis or initial question, ACDF comparing to ACDF, is it better to implant the disc prosthesis? Well, when we evaluate the clinical results five years after surgery, then we see that clinically ACDA is really comparable to ACDF in our group of patients. And there were not more reoperations at the adjacent level. The, the prosthesis is more expensive than the fusion operation. And therefore we would not recommend to implant a prosthesis. The other question that we would like to um, address is should we perform an ACD? that's even cheaper, and if it gives the same result, then we can also avoid the problems that a cage can have or that a prosthesis can have. However, we would not recommend that. What we've seen five years after surgery is that clinical outcome is worse comparing to ACDA or ACDF. So we think that this might be true because there is some delayed fusion. And well, we do not know that yet. That is something that we will study in the um, time that's still to come. So what we think is that um, in future study, what we should study is fusion. And not only whether fusion takes place or not, but also is the fusion timely? If the fusion occurs in an earlier stage, then maybe patients will do better. So when we read articles about comparisons of ACDA and ACDF, then we usually read more research should be performed um, in the area of the prosthesis. We do not agree on that with that. What I think is that it is important to focus on timely fusion and um, what fusion um, means for the final outcome. Um, well, this is my last uh, slide. If you want to read about the uh, long-term results of the neck, uh, neck trial, you can read it in the Spine Journal. And well, um, we had a presentation about it on the in the NAS, and we keep on working on um, the outcome data of this study because what I've showed you now the 
clinical outcome data of the five-year study and some of the radiological results, but currently we are working on the evaluation of all the x-rays that have been performed five years thereafter, focusing on fusion and on the heterotopic ossification and on flexion, deflection. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Fleckert, uh, for your wonderful lecture, uh, introducing us the results of your laborious work. Thank you and congratulations uh, on your teamwork and research group as well. Thank you. Uh, my question would be, I don't see questions in the chat yet, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, from purely surgical point of view, um, when you are making a decision, uh, to proceed with these three options, what you take majorly in consideration, the age of the patient, the nerve circumference, the BMI, and what are your, uh, how to say, directions? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for your question. Well, in, in, if you want to implant an ACDA, you have to be trained in that because mm -hmm. a prosthesis is, um, well, it's, it's, it's more difficult to implant. It's when you've, when you, when, when you've done uh, several, like 20 or, or then, then it's very much, then it's doable. However, um, if you want to implant a prosthesis, I think it is very important that um, the um, cervical spine still looks like it's a young spine so that it deserves mobility. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say the disc is also, the, sorry, the prosthesis is high. Um, is Well, you need at least five, better not uh, even six millimeters. And um, the, um, the, the, the vertebra, they have to be aligned properly. And then you can very nicely put in a prosthesis. However, what we've seen is that heterotopic ossification occurs in, well, mm -hmm. almost 50 to 60%. So um, then it's just a waste of money because then it serves as a cage. However, what you should avoid is to implant a prosthesis if the disc height is not, is not, is not high enough. In our clinic, we do not implant this prosthesis because from we think our results are convincing that this is not better than a cage. And a cage has several advantages, namely it's less expensive, it's much easier to implant, and it's um, also easier for the nurses to work with. So to avoid well, possible problems, we just implant the cage. I have to stress in our clinic, we do not put on a plate. So uh, that lowers the costs and we have good results with that. I still perform an ACD every now and then when the interdiscal space is actually too, too small. When it is um, difficult to get in a four millimeter cage, I do not want to put too much stress on the uh, facet joints and to get it in no matter what. So then I don't put anything in. And well, I think our results with that are, um, are, are, are good. Thank you so much. Uh, you don't ever use the plates or it's just uh, depends on the stability of the cervical spine or in well, we any use, case? Yes, yeah. we use um, 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 plates in trauma. Then mm -hmm. we, um, uh, because then we, think the ligaments are also um, uh, um, um, lax and also on the other levels. And um, so there we always use um, a plate, but in regular cases for degenerative disease, we do not use a plate. Okay, thank you so much. And one more oh, question. I have to say, I have to say yeah. what you have to make sure, and I made that mistake once, please, please do so when a patient has dystonia, or Down mm -hmm. syndrome. Mm -hmm. If a patient has, I didn't think of it that time, but this patient was moving his neck so vigorously that um, the cage came out. So um, those patients, you should in, uh, implant a, um, a, uh, a plate. Wow, well, thank you. Um, very good tip. Thank you so much. And one more question. It's not actually related to our topic, but I just wanted to ask. Uh, in your uh, biography, there was mentioned you were interested in anachondroplasia. So yeah. in what sort of view, in a neurosurgical view, I was wondering. 
Uh, well, well, um, you can invite me one more hour about echondroplasia because echondroplasia is is is, is really very very interesting. Is um, the main the main problem in a chondroplast patient is that the length of their spine is comparable to ours, yeah. non echondroplast I should say. However, the interpedicle space is smaller. They have a problem in the ossification. Um, in the vertebra and in the pedicles. And therefore, the space that remains for the nervous tissue is much smaller, not only in the AP, but also in the, um, uh, in, so not only horizontal, but also in the vertical. So it's, 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 the circle is smaller. That means that upon normal degeneration, they will encounter problems of nerve compression in, in an earlier stage than non-echondroplasts will. Moreover, echondroplasts are born with a toracolumbar kyphosis and a, that um, um, induces a lumbar lordosis. So what they have, they have a smaller canal, they have more lumbar lordosis, they have a sacrum that is more horizontal, so they are really prone for a neurogenic claudication due to uh, spinal stenosis. And that is mostly uh, present in the lumbar spine. It can also be present in the thoracic spine and also in the cervical spine. But the lumbar spine, it occurs, well, pretty often. So interesting. I think, Dr. Hassan, we can uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Fleckhorn for another great lecture. We would be <laughs> glad to host you. This topic will be amazing to hear. And okay. we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so, Maria. Uh, uh, I, I will, I will speak out as well. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think we can hear him. We can. Can you hear my voice now or not? No, no. Uh, Professor Bektash will uh, ask his question himself. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your excellent presentation and sharing your important data with us. You planned beautifully and you performed beautifully. Thank you very much. My question is that what is your strategy on opening the posterior longitudinal ligament? Yes. Because I am I am an old surgeon. <laughs> I performed a lot of uh, discectomies without fusions in the past. And we have the same results as you mentioned, All, but uh, we do not have uh, more MRIs at that time, only uh, X-rays, we follow up the patients like that, but we do not have a lot of patients with say uh, adjacent segment disease at that time. Yeah. That's the reason why I'm asking. Question. Yeah, what we do with the, uh, the posterior ligament, ligament yes, always, yes. Open. always open. Always open. Always. Wide open. opening. Wide opening. Wide opening. Foramen yes. to foramen. Yeah. Yes. Foramen. Complete destruction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But I was, I'm interested in your question because you're mentioning that you did not put anything in, you, so you also perform this ACD. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And well, I'm happy that you say that because usually when I present this uh, or in the States or, or then they think, oh, that foolish blonde woman, why does she also include this, this ACD group? But th this was done in our clinic for a long mm -hmm. time. So we, we wanted to know whether it was indeed the same result. And mm -hmm. I was convinced all the time that it would be as good. However, our five-year data now, I have to admit that I'd better put in a cage. Also, while we are uh, familiar with using these Midas-Rex instruments, I uh, try to prevent the anterior part of the uncovertebral junction in order to avoid uh, uh, the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see what you're doing. And I, um, I'm quite sure that it's not a bad thing. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you're you welcome. again. Okay. Okay, Mariam. Mariam. Do you hear me? Madonna, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Professor Fleckhardt, for your response. Thank you, Dr. Baktash, for your Mar question. Okay, Mariam. We've got. Mariam, I think he is not I hearing me. 
Uh, okay, so we've got one more question uh, in the chat. Uh, Temi Ogaji, uh, he is a medical student in Georgia from Scotland. Uh, thank you for your insightful presentation, Professor. I'm a first year medical student from Georgia. I was wondering, as you mentioned, uh, improved uh, HADS uh, scores correlated with a better perceived outcome. So would administering post-op counseling be beneficial along with pre-op or is the pre-op counseling alone sufficient when looking at the clinical significance of outcomes? Great question. Thank you, Tammy. Well, um, um, when you're looking at, uh, when you're considering pre-operative counseling, what you want to um, reach with that is to give the patient a good idea of what can what you what you as a surgeon can really improve for this patient, because um, sometimes the perception of patients are not realistic. So you want to uh, make it as realistic as uh, you can, but the outcome differs from patient to patient because no one. People are all different. So what we would like is to have prediction models that we can put in the properties of particular patients and then, well, give them the best idea of the outcome they can expect. And what I've just demonstrated that anxiety and depression, they are a, a very important factor. So I think that, that that was clear for you that what that means to us. Yeah. However, um, if... Uh, a patient is still not happy after surgery, I think that, um, yeah, you can call it counseling, but I would rather call it um, coaching of these patients after the surgical intervention to have them deal with their problems can be beneficial. So if a patient is not uh, does, does not feel that he or she has a satisfactory outcome of the surgical intervention, then I and, and and nothing can be done anymore. The, the radiologically they look fine and well and actually when I do my tests they they are doing fine. Then I would like to I, I like to send them to rehabilitation just to be able to better deal with the problems they have because I think that that is um, yeah one of the main problems. But I think that the percentage of patients that you have to send to rehabilitation after surgery can diminish or can decrease when you do um, improved preoperative counseling. And that is why we are also momentarily working with deep learning models, because there are things of, things that we can uh, think of that are important in preoperative counseling. Like I mentioned, like the, um, the disc height, like the BMI, like smoking, like age, like gender. But maybe there are, or I'm quite certain, there are things that we cannot think of, but maybe the computer can help us with that. So that's why we're also very interested in these deep learning models, but we're still working on that. Thank you so much. Professor Hassan, maybe you have some questions or comments? Uh, no, I want to thank to the professor. Maybe Mariam, I want to ask. Uh, I would like to say some things, if you hear my voice, hopefully. Yeah, it, so it, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Carmen, thanks a lot for the interesting presentation. I'm really amazed because uh, during your presentation and your research, uh, you did not classic standardized uh, systematic review or presentation, but it was uh, depends to personalized medicine. And I liked it so much because you included the psych psychological things, which is really important uh, with patients. And sometimes doctors don't take attention with it. They think that, that such kind of uh, health issues affecting the psycho emotional status and that's all. After um, you will do everything, that operation or treatment or rehabilitation, it will be gone. But sometimes patients... Um, still have it. So it's really good that you concentrated on that. I'm interested in, uh, you uh, mentioned in your research, I uh, saw your research and I read it, uh, the questionnaires, uh, what you asked to patients. So I'm interested in what was the content of that questionnaire? Because the questionnaires, uh, question there was not mentioned in that research. So I'm interested in what was the content of it? You were checking the patient's psycho-emotional status or what you are checking? And also I have another question. Uh, during your 
the research you we are doing double blinded uh, studies yes so i'm interested in what kind of biases and what kind of things you face too during your research that made your research complicated and you uh, had done some kind of things uh, to overcome this kind of biases or things during the research I'm interested in, uh, beside of the psychological things. Okay, Thanks. well, to answer the first part of your question that uh, concerns what, uh, how did you evaluate the hospital anxiety of the anxiety and depression, so the mental status of the patient? Well, the, we decided to take a standardized uh, questionnaire for that, the HATS, and um, um, it it, con it it contains questions like. Um, uh, are you often feeling um, uh, depressed? So that, just that question, but also questions that you can um, classify a patient, whether this patient is um, feeling that um, bad things always happen to them. Because if you ask me in advance in, 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 in patients who will be doing good and which patient will um, give disappointing results, then usually it is the type of patients that think that 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 thinks that their body is like something magical. Like, well, I do not know, but did all the bad things always happen to me? Oh, and when you say, well, very exceptional, it can happen that, um, well, let's say you have a CSF leak. Oh, exceptional things always happen to me. And and that's, yeah, and, and that type of personality, you want to you wanna quantify that. And that is possible with this HATS scale. And I'm quite sure there are other skills that can also classify patients in that respect. But this HATS skill, that works really good for us. And I have to tell you what we do now in uh, the clinic where I'm now, I've been operating all day. So, <laughs> But what we do in this clinic, we ask those patients to fill this in at home. So several questions, an ODI and an EQ5D, but also this HATS. And before they enter my outpatient clinic room, I can see their values. So then I know in advance, before they come in, what type of patients it is. So I can see when they have leg pain, like a nine, back pain, like a, like a, a, a five, but a depression scale, which is, well, 24, which is really high, then I know how to better, how to approach this patient. Because you cannot always tell by just talking to the patient. So I think that's really, really convenient. And uh, I would really recommend it to, um, to, to, if you do prompts, to involve that into it. And your other question was about, um, oh yeah, what, what problems did you uh, uh, encounter in the double blinding? Yeah, double blinding is not as easy as you think because patients are really curious. What I went through with them um, to the, 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 how they wanted to be deblinded. So what happened is that after surgery, we send them to the radiological the radiology department. So in the beginning, they uh, asked the uh, the the, the um, you know the um, uh, uh, it's not not the radiologist, the one who helps the radiologist. I do not know what's called the yes. uh, technician. Yeah. The technician. Yeah, they yeah. asked the technician. Uh, oh yeah, can you please tell me what you see? Is it something with two mobile things or just one thing. So these technicians, I knew them because I was on call all the time. So um, I, I told them, no, 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 you, can, you cannot tell them. But they, they become even, they became so inventive. What they also, oh, my pen is dropping. I will pick it up myself. <laughs> so I really have to give instructions to the technicians. Like they cannot see, they cannot see it. What, what, and they also, they were evaluating the, um, um, they were, they were convincing the, research nurses to look into the operating notes. So in the end, we decided in the in our notes of operation, we had to use codes. We could not um, write down implanted the prosthesis because one way or another, they, they, they knew someone, they really wanted to find out. So if you really want to double blind, well, Cons well, t keep in mind that patients are very, very, very inventive in finding out what they really have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. And if anyone has question in the chat, or if you want to speak out, you can also speak out and ask her directly questions. Okay, I think we have finished all the questions and comments. I want to thank again one more time, Professor Lankham. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you all for your contributions. Thank you for having me. Okay, have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Good luck.